What's this? Another Super NES book so soon? Let's dive in yet again. Hi everyone, John here. First, an explanation. I made a terrible oversight. After reviewing four books, or rather, four groups of books, that cover the library of the Super NES, I re-reviewed them against each other in what I called the Super NES Encyclopedia Super Showdown. I called the video that because the books are like encyclopedias, since they each attempt to cover every game released for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. And yet, here's this book I missed, literally titled the SNES Encyclopedia. Every game released for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. And, to make it even more ridiculous, it's not like I didn't know about this series. You can even see at the end of my previous video that I teased a future comparison video of several NES books, in which I included, in this shot, the NES Encyclopedia by Chris Scullion. That book snuck up on me that I didn't get around to reviewing it, and then figured I would do that later, though before I compare all of the NES books. Then this SNES follow-up was released in late autumn 2020 while I was hard at work writing my previous video and somehow slipped under my radar and ended up not being included in that multiple book comparison when it has every right to have been a part of it. I was so proud of that video too as it is one of my best works, but now I know it's incomplete without also looking at this. As if to further drive the point home that this is very much in the family of the other books, aside from the subject matter, obviously. It is also newly released, as if everyone just decided to write about the Super NES nearly simultaneously, almost 30 years later. And just like the other books, it comes in multiple volumes or covers. In this case, it is covers featuring either the North American design or the European design. Apparently, if you're going to write a book about 16-bit Nintendo, you have to have multiple volumes, versions, or covers. That's just the way it is. Anyway, this is a look at the SNES Encyclopedia by Chris Scullion. Despite being hastily prepared, well, relatively, this will still be a fair, objective look. And because it was missed in the comparison video, after the review, I will compare it to the other books. But first, let's put this book in the spotlight. The SNES Encyclopedia, every game released for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, has a title that pretty much describes itself. Written by Chris Scullion, a Scottish video game journalist, it has a quick look at 780 Super NES games. Well, it says 780 on the back. But in the intro before the reviews, he says 779, which is also the number I got when I manually counted them. Because putting effort into my reviews is what I do. So, a good place to start would be to take inventory here. Every game released is in the title. So let's check if this is indeed the case. From my North American perspective, I start by checking those games first. And I see 715 licensed games. This falls short of the usual base number of 721 cartridges, but that's actually fair since it doesn't include 6 carts that are either compilations or reskins, so he has technically reviewed all the games. No loss there, unless you really need to read again about versions with different titles, or different rosters, or the unique Luigi sprite in the version of Super Mario World included in Super Mario All-Stars plus Super Mario World. He specifically says in his intro that he chose not to include the multi-game releases, so that and the Exotainment Mountain Bike Rally and Speed Racer combo cart are omitted by design, and not by oversight. Back to the count, there is a singular unlicensed game at the time, Super 3D Noah's Ark. And then there's an entry for Max, which was commissioned by the US Army to train users on a replica M16 rifle. This is odd, in my opinion, because Max cartridges were not commercially released. So why include this in the book, but not other similar, limited run, not for retail cartridges, like those used in competitions, for instance. There are actually three variants of the cartridge, but they're just counted as one here. Then instead of 61, there are 62 European exclusives. You're seeing 63 boxes on screen right now though, since normally I would have excluded one of the sensible soccer games, since its North American counterpart, Championship Soccer 94, would have already been included in my North American count. Here, Sensible Soccer European Champions and Sensible Soccer International Edition, or as it's known on the box, International Sensible Soccer World Champions Limited Edition featuring World Cup teams count as two separate games, an exception to the no reskins rule, and despite being versions, one earlier, one later, of Championship Soccer 94, which does not get its own entry here, but is included in my 715 count since I counted one of the Sensible Soccers in place of it. Clear? No? That's okay, it'll come up again. Anyway, 715 plus 1 plus 1 plus 62 comes out to 779 cartridges. Scullion says the book is a definitive collection and not a work in progress, 
and as such, he only focuses on games released during the console's main run. I like this focus. So there are no unreleased or cancelled games, no aftermarket releases, and no Star Fox 2, which I feel should go without saying, but other books think otherwise. We'll compare this to the others later though. Back to Championship Soccer 94, as mentioned, you'd have to read about it in the entry for Sensible Soccer International Edition. This is inconsistent, because regarding games having different titles, depending on which side of the Atlantic they are on, Scullion specifically says he has listed each game by the title it has in the region it first launched in. But if that were the case, shouldn't that mean this should have been listed as an entry for Championship Soccer 94? Or if Championship Soccer 94 is more like the original Sensible Soccer European Champions, as even GameFAQ suggests, then shouldn't Championship Soccer 94 be mentioned in the Sensible Soccer European Champions entry and indicated as also an American release? My gosh, Sensible Soccer is the least sensible thing ever. Aside from that, be aware that if you're looking for games based on their North American names, that Adventures of Kid Cleats is listed as Soccer Kid, Elite Soccer is listed as World Cup Striker, Out of This World is listed as Another World, Soldiers of Fortune is listed as The Chaos Engine, and World Soccer 94 Road to Glory is listed as Striker. Note that of these six games, four of them involve soccer, or football if you prefer. However, Adventures of Kid Cleats, or Soccer Kid, is really a platformer, not a sports game. So excluding that, we still have three soccer games causing confusion. Three soccer games. Again. We'll talk about how this book compares to the others later, but if you've seen my Super NES Encyclopedia Super Showdown video, you know that the curse of the three soccer games that make things confusing is something that's already popped up more than once even before now, and each time it's a different three games for a different reason. But always soccer, so I just had to mention it. Anyway, as stated, we have 779 reviews for all the games for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System here, including Max. And this is specifically about the Super NES. There are no Japanese Super Famicom games here. As a bonus, bringing the total of game reviews to a not quite round 801 is a Virtual Boy section, since the short-lived Virtual Boy didn't warrant another book. Well, at least not according to Chris Scullion. Jeremy Parrish thinks otherwise, and Jeffrey Whittinghagen too. But that's another thing altogether. Anyway, the Virtual Boy only had 22 distinct games released across North America and Japan, so we do indeed see a few Japanese exclusives here, and Europe was spared from seeing this officially released there. Though a shorter section, it's laid out in the same format. And that format is this, a review of around 125 words, a single screenshot, and a fact for each game. Most reviews take up a quarter of a page, though 70 Super NES games are worthy of more coverage and get half a page. Okay, maybe worthy is too strong a word, because Home Alone is here for some reason. Obviously, for those with half a page, there is more text, but also a larger screenshot, and 29 of the most popular and iconic games have the honor of having a whole page, which now also includes the box art. Despite this book treating American and European games equally otherwise, the box art images for these favorite games are the North American versions, except three, including the soccer games, only two this time though, and Earthworm Jim for some reason. There is no box art for the 750 small and medium sized reviews, which is a shame. And only one screenshot for each game is a bit too light in my opinion, especially for the games with variety where only one image can't possibly do it justice. He's really going to show a boring hallway from really early on and with no interesting puzzles or enemies for the screenshot of The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, one of the best games of all time? I would have preferred four small screenshots instead of one big one for these full page entries, but maybe that's just me. I noticed that many of these screenshots are from early areas in the games, though I suppose that's common with books of this type. The reviews are pretty standard, usually about the story and gameplay, and maybe about any other notable features, or its legacy, anything worth mentioning in a handful of sentences. I did sometimes feel like he could have talked more about certain aspects of particular games, like about Ogre Battle's gameplay or Paladin Quest's look, but for the most part these reviews are good, concise summaries. In the header of each review, there are icons showing the flags of the United States and Europe. The Virtual Boy section has flags for the United States and Japan. These simply show, with a check mark, where the games have been released, and with an X if it was not released there. The Max game, despite being a US Army game, seems ironically not indicated as being released in America, so I guess the check marks mean their retail availability. And you may have noticed, Canada and Mexico are forgotten about. Sure, here in Canada I know we get the same games as in the United States. But, you know, as a Canadian, I always have to point out how Canada is eternally snubbed in the presence of the United States. 
Canada is an especially amusing thing to omit when Scullion points out that his wife is Canadian in a couple of the facts. So let's get into the facts, which are a standout and unique thing about this book. Every single review has one, with each one around 30 words or so. There are usually something not so critical about the game as to be naturally included in the main description, but worth mentioning as an aside. They can be of some interesting or amusing trivia about that game. They can be tips or secret codes. They might be spoilers and or descriptions of endings. They can be about re-releases, ports, or regional differences. They can do some myth busting or be about something like pronunciation. They can be a bit more tangential, like about the original property a licensed game is based on more than the game itself. You've just seen a number of examples on screen right now. Maybe go back and try to guess which game each fact is related to. Even I learned some things. As a Mega Man fan, it is surprising that this is the first I've heard of Mega Man Soccer actually having an ending, but only viewable with a cheat device. I also learned about Phalanx's infamous box art, that a plot webcomic made by the original creators exists, and that Super Godzilla's final boss is Bagan, a monster planned for numerous Godzilla films, but has the curse of never actually being featured in any of them. Also, a boss theme in Wolverine Adamantium Rage is the first known instance of grime music. Neat stuff. Now these might not always be about that game in particular, but that game's series as a whole. For instance, both Sonic Blast Man and its sequel have facts that are instead of both a much different original arcade game, and the one for Ultima 7 The Black Gate is actually about Ultima 9 Ascension. The Virtual Boy games all have facts too, and you get stuff like V Tetris's being about a fake version of the NES Tetris manual which is a bit of a stretch. Regardless, overall, this is a neat idea and keeps the reviews fresh with new and quirky info. I've already read about these games up to four times over in other books, so I'm especially appreciating these fun facts. Also helpful with levity is the British sense of humor, which Scullion notes himself in his introduction, embracing us for a notable increase in bad jokes, which were partly added to keep him sane throughout the process of writing this book while prioritizing the needs of a newborn baby daughter. Humor is always welcome, and though a new father, he is clearly ready with dad jokes, especially puns. Like for Boogerman, regarding an HD sequel, it's not gonna happen. Or Bubsy, who doesn't have a good feline about this. The Incredible Crash Dummies repairing themselves with No Arm Done. And Wolfchild probably won't end up liking what's gonna happen. When reading about something like that there are real life golf pros in PGA European Tour, and you read, you can't control them. By which I mean you can't play as them, not that they're maniacs. It certainly evokes a chuckle. Or about Thomas the Tank Engine and friends. There isn't a child alive who doesn't like Thomas the Tank Engine, as long as you don't count the ones that don't. It can be subtle in that British way, which I appreciate. I rolled my eyes at his comment wondering about there being 3048 games between MechWarrior and MechWarrior 3050, or the name dropping of the infamous Cheetah Man and Super 3D Noah's Ark in the history of the SNES intro piece but I would take any attempt at humor over none any day. The history of the SNES that I just mentioned is just a very short introduction of the Super NES near the beginning of the book. There's also a foreword from Kevin Bayliss of Rare and Platonic Games, an introduction of the book from, and also about, Chris Scullion himself, and a page about the games, both in general and about how they are presented in this book. There's also an intro to the bonus section featuring the Virtual Boy. Aside from a few ads from back in the day interspersed within those, and an index in the back listing the games by both their North American and European names, that is all there is to this book. There are no huge editorials, there are no looks at the various controllers or peripherals, no dedicated gallery of box art or ads, no technical breakdown, nothing supplementary like that. I guess it is just like the title says. It's about every game released for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. And so, aside from the Virtual Boy section, it's nothing more and nothing less. Just some good old reviews and some neat facts. On that note, time for a fact check. Yep, it wouldn't be a John Learn 1 video if I didn't get nitpicky and point out some of the errors that I found. I don't know if these might be corrected if there are ever any reprintings of this book, but this copy, presumably a first printing, definitely has these goofs. Nothing personal, Mr. Scullion. I do this for everybody. And if anyone thinks I'm being harsh, consider that this is literally an encyclopedia. If it isn't correct, then what is the point, really? So, here we go! Super Mario World's review says this game features many things for the first time in the series, including the Koopalings, Bowser's bratty children. First off, 
Absolutely not, as they were the bosses of Super Mario Bros. 3, only the most hyped NES game of all time. For a popular game in a popular series, this is a pretty bad error. Also, as of 2012, the Koopalings have been retconned and are no longer considered Bowser's children. Okay, okay, true, that's a retroactive thing, so maybe it's not fair to rake Scully and over the coals for that one. As at the time of the game's original release, the Koopalings certainly were described as Bowser's kids. But Super Mario World is definitely not their first appearance. Speaking of turtle-like boss characters not actually making a debut in the fourth main console installment, but first in 16 bits, of a popular series, in the review for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4 Turtles in Time, Metalhead is described as a robotic turtle designed just for this game, which is totally incorrect. He first appeared in the 1987 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon series in a 1989 episode called The Making of Metalhead, which predates the arcade version of Turtles in Time by 16 months and the Super NES version by 21 months. I'm so confused! Maybe I'll just blast EVERYBODY! Now, it's possible he may have confused Metalhead with Mecha Turtle, another robot turtle character who debuted in the first NES game. But we're not talking about that game. Again on the topic of displaced debuts, the Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 description implies that Ermac is a returning character. But he's not. Now, a little trivia interlude. Ermac's origin can indeed be traced back to the early versions of the original arcade game, where there is a counter for Ermax, as in Error Macros, in an audit menu listed directly under Reptile Battles, and seeing them listed together might make one assume these are related. Since Reptile is a hidden character in that first game, someone named Ermac might be one too, but this was entirely fan speculation and an erroneous assumption. A couple cryptic messages in Mortal Kombat 2 actually deny the existence of Ermac. So Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 is his true debut as a canonical and playable character in the Mortal Kombat series, and so he's not being reinstated since he was nothing more than a rumor until this. Something that did come back is the Terminator. But in Terminator 2, including T2, the arcade game, for the Super NES, he's helping to prevent Judgment Day. That's right, J-U-D-G no E M-E-N-T Day. Now, while Judgment with the first E is common in British English, Judgment without the first E is common in North America, yet commonality aside is technically correct everywhere as it is written this way in legal contexts. I figure I don't always need to point out minor spelling errors, but writing sick, Latin for thus, has always seemed to be a snobby way of pointing out a spelling error, except here it's not an error, which makes it irresistible to mention. If you're going to correct someone, you might want to make sure you're correct first. Oh what the heck, here's a couple more mishaps with the letter E. Young Merlin shares his name with a type of fish, as he's Marlin here, and the ancient machine in Plans Quest, Dalgren, is written as Dalgreen here, which sounds like a chain of American pharmacies. Alright, enough of the spelling errors. I have no segue for these last few noteworthy errors. Harvest Moon's review lists Animal Crossing as a farming simulator. Other than pumpkins intended for Halloween and Animal Crossing New Horizons, the series is really not at all about farming. And the highlighted fact for World Heroes is only partially factual saying that the Fatal Match has electrified walls. It can have them, but there are also flames, spikes, and slippery surfaces, which aren't that hard to also mention. Another odd omission of sorts is in Sonic Blast Man's review. The Super NES game differs from the original arcade game which involves actual punching, and he uses a bit of text to explain all that, but then he doesn't mention that the arcade game stages are actually included, but are now bonus rounds in between the main brawling stages. Given that he dedicates the facts of both Sonic Blast Man's Super NES game reviews to trivia about the arcade game, he gives the impression that he knows about it, but then he calls the first Super NES game completely different, as if to weirdly disavow the arcade game's new existence as punchy interludes. Outside of fact checks, it's always easy for me to notice if something is up with alphabetization. This isn't an encyclopedia after all, so it's got to be in order. The review of True Golf Classics Pebble Beach Golf Links specifically says, right at the start, that the joys of alphabetical order mean we're looking at the series backwards, in reference to the other True Golf games. Yet, the WWF games are put in release order, and definitely not in alphabetical order. Only pointing this out, since he drew attention to it. Now that I'm done ripping into it, I will point out that these are most of the errors that I personally noticed that are worth mentioning, and some barely so. It's possible that there could be more errors that I missed, but I am doubtful that they would be major or many. I can be a jerk and go on about a dozen errors, but those are absolutely the exceptions, and not the rule, so you still have multiple hundreds of 100% accurate reviews. So misplacing the origins of robot turtle or Koopaling bosses should not weigh too heavily against this book. 
But it is almost time to compare against the other books vying for your 16-bit Nintendo needs. So let's wrap this up and give it a rating. The SNES Encyclopedia, every game released for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System by Chris Scullion, is exactly that. Reviews of every main Super NES game. Though I personally would not have included Max, the US Army Rifle Training Simulation, without including other rarities for consistency, at least there were no notable exclusions. Unless you wanted to look at the hardware like controllers or peripherals, as there's none of that here, since its sole focus is games. The Virtual Boy section is considered a bonus section. But bonus in the sense that by its very nature, it is very small overall, since Virtual Boy Library is covered in the same manner and just as fully as the Super NES Library. Perhaps even more so in a sense, since there are Japanese Virtual Boy games here. Virtual Boy games might actually be a selling point here, as while there are indeed dedicated Virtual Boy books like those from Jeffrey Whittinghagen and Jeremy Parrish, it's not a popular library to write about. The reviews are concise, usually not too light or too heavy with details, and make for good overviews. Humor is very appreciated. It's not side-splitting hilarity, but keeps the tone very readable for those of us who take in every word from cover to cover. However, the visual element is a bit too light here, with no box art except for select games, and only a single screenshot regardless of review size. Some screenshots are somewhat small. For some games, it's hard to expect a single screenshot to be really representative of the game as a whole, so that speaks to the necessity of having more, especially for the full page reviews for the 29 popular games where there should have been room to feature a few. Every game review includes a fact, which is an amusing or interesting tidbit about the game itself or something related to it. These facts, and the Virtual Boy section, are the most unique features of this book, so I think any 1990s Nintendo fan should be happy to have the SNES Encyclopedia. Let's give it a 4 out of 5. Thanks for watching another one of my video game book reviews. But now we get to why I rearranged my video release schedule to do this one, to compare this to the other four sets of books that cover the Super NES, as seen in my previous video. Consider this an update to the Super NES Encyclopedia Super Showdown. Yes, I said that I like the SNES Encyclopedia, but how does it stack up against the others? On to the Super NES Encyclopedia Super Showdown, Super Addendum. We'll compare the books with the same categories as before. So first up, the covers. The SNES Encyclopedia has the same cover options as the book that I said has the best covers. Ultimate Nintendo Guide to the SNES Library and that you have a choice of buying it with the image of the North American Super NES or the Super NES that the rest of the world has. Well, the SNES Omnibus just shows a controller, but the SNES Encyclopedia adds the console too, so I guess that is better just because it has more? Yet it's really rather basic. Adequate, sure, it gets the job done, but it's just a Super NES with one controller and no game. Now if you look at the cover of the Super Nintendo Anthology, that looks like a Super NES or perhaps the same Super NES, as it is at the exact same angle. The controller in most of its cable is positioned differently relative to the console. We can see it is facing the same way, and even has the same upside down U-loop on top that suggests it's unlikely to be a coincidence. Probably nothing wrong in using the same stock image of a Super NES, but the Super Nintendo Anthology takes the extra step of stylizing the image. So by default, this is simply less exciting. So put this book at 4th place out of 6. Again, nothing fundamentally wrong with it, it's just that the others put in some effort to dress it up. For counting the games, it's a simple numerical situation. I redid my game count table to include the SNES Encyclopedia. From most to the least, it takes 4th place out of 6 again, with 779 games. If you're wondering why the image on screen is cycling between the two sensible soccer games, it is because, as mentioned earlier, it's unclear which one is considered the equivalent of Championship Soccer 94, which I've already counted when I count the North American games. But this game features both sensible soccers, so there is indeed an extra one, but just sort of in quantum flux as to which one. Anyway, quite simply, the SNES Encyclopedia, with the North American and European libraries, put it above those that just have the North American libraries, but below those that have at least some of the Japanese Super Famicom games. That's kind of obvious. The Virtual Boy games wouldn't really make sense to count here when we're talking about 16-bit Nintendo console games, but even if we did, at 801 games, it wouldn't change its position relative to the others. For the most part, it really comes down to which regions of the world you need to read about. Fun fact, the SNES Encyclopedia joins Ultimate Nintendo, Guide to the SNES Library, in calling the one unlicensed game Super 3D Noah's Ark, whereas all the other books call it Super Noah's Ark 3D. How do you read it? 
I've also updated the word count table so that we can compare review sizes of the SNES Encyclopedia with all the other books. The five random sample games I chose earlier still aren't seen as extraordinary enough to get longer than average reviews here, so that means I didn't have to change them to maintain just the commonly sized reviews. It's a comparison against four others instead of five, since the two versions of the complete SNES have the same reviews. So on the SNES Encyclopedia, the reviews average 125.6 words, the facts average 33.6 words, or a bit more than a quarter of the size of the main reviews, for a combined average of 159.2 words. In this group of five, this place is a third, right in the middle. Sure, that's considered a bronze based on number of words alone, if more equals better. But if you were like Aristotle, who sought the golden mean, or Goldilocks, and favor the middle ground, then you might personally consider this gold in the sense that it is not too much and not too little. It might be just right for you. Like the books on the extremes, the complete SNES and Ultimate Nintendo Guide to the SNES Library, it's consistent in its review sizes, and, at least with this sample, never has the largest or smallest reviews across all books. But then again, there are also the longer reviews for the favorites. Comparing the 29 games that get full page reviews with all the other games indicated as favorites in all the other books, we find that there are two games not favorited by the other books. So what are they? Soccer games again. Of course they would create more work for me. Well this time it's just two, so maybe the curse isn't limited to three. So I've added FIFA International Soccer and International Superstar Soccer to this list of favorites. Here are the favorites of each of the books again. Previously I said there are six games favorited by every book. Well, actually seven, since the complete SNES Pocket Editions picks override the complete SNES Definitive Editions, meaning that it ignores that the Definitive Edition didn't originally put a Minish Cap car container next to Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island. And these seven games are still favored here in the SNES Encyclopedia, maintaining their streak of perfection. Thanks to the SNES Encyclopedia also liking Harvest Moon and Mario Paint, now the excessively generous Complete SNES Pocket Edition only likes 101 games that no one else does, instead of 103. Not that it changes anything, really. While the opinion of a writer about which games are the best have no direct bearing on the quality of a book, selecting 29 games here does seem like a reasonable number, compared to other books with as few as 11 or as many as 171. Coincidentally, besides the 29 games favored by the SNES Encyclopedia, there are also 29 games favored by three or more books out of five. There are only six games different between them. It's interesting that with more and more books weighing in, you get a clear picture of what games are considered the best. Maybe it's not technically possible to get an objective definition of what makes a game great, seeing as how it's subjective. But there can certainly be a strong consensus about it. I really feel like Diddy's Conquest should be up there though. As explained in the main review of the SNES Encyclopedia earlier, the Virtual Boy section is a bonus. If I compare this with Virtual Boy books later, then the whole Super NES section could be a bonus. The fact with each review is neat too. While other books do have additional info for certain games, here Scullion went all out to ensure that every single game gets some trivia, with no exceptions. Not all of them are mind-blowing, but the attempt is appreciated. Now, I wasn't sure where to mention this, but it could sort of be a unique feature that this feels like a book you can easily carry around. All these other books are books, sure, but they can also be described as MASSIVE TOMES. They might look good on a coffee table or on a shelf, but as much as I like more and more info, you do have to deal with physical both. Except of course the pocket edition of the complete SNES. Now that's a tiny pocket guide, not to mention hard to read due to its size. So with weight, just like the number of games and review sizes, the SNES Encyclopedia falls into that middle ground, which could be a good thing. Price is a tricky category to compare. Going by numbers can be especially cold here, and price doesn't necessarily equate with worth. As I said before, you should go over the reviews carefully and decide what book or books that you want, and hopefully the price is secondary. But if we must compare, the price of the SNES Encyclopedia is 30 British pounds, or 39.95 in US dollars, from Pen and Sword Books. This puts it only a nickel away from the complete SNES Definitive Edition from Higgins Alley Books, which has box art for every game and reviews for over 300 Super Famicom games. Five cents more for all that. The SNES Encyclopedia is also less than five dollars from just the software volume of the Super Nintendo Anthology, which has every Super NES and Super Famicom game. 
but now instead of soccer games, you'll be cursing the Mahjong and Pachinko games. Which, if you're like me, you probably don't feel like you need to read about. And the games of any type that you do want to read about might not have as much written about them. In any case, consider each book's unique features and what each do or do not cover. And as long as you know what you're getting, you won't be disappointed. Oh yeah, if you prefer, you can get the SNS Encyclopedia on Kindle through Amazon for only $13. If my score is of any value to you, I gave the SNES Encyclopedia a 4, as seen earlier in this same video. This puts it on the same level as the SNES Omnibus and only the software volume of the Super Nintendo Anthology. The SNES Omnibus wrote more and has more visuals, but is North American only, whereas the Super Nintendo Anthology covers the whole world but is less written per game. So despite these all scoring a 4, they're not all the same. Final words on Chris Scullion's book. Compared to the other books about the Super NES, the SNES Encyclopedia really does feel like it's in the middle in many ways, but it could be to its favor. Its cover is plain, but at least it doesn't look bad, even if it's not gussied up. With all the North American and European games, it is more than the books that focus on only North America, and obviously less than the books that cover everywhere, including Japan. Its review sizes are concise, and even though they look short, they really are mid-sized compared to the others. The number of games that get extra coverage isn't a statement of its quality, but I did find 29 to be a good number of favorites, which I think means it is reasonable, not like other books with only a few or way too many. The book isn't a tiny pocket guide or a massive tome, making it an easy, comfortable read. I gave it a 4 out of 5, the same as two other books. But if you don't need box art or Super Famicom games, I might really recommend this one in particular, if you just want a nice book that doesn't need to be excessive. And so, this is the SNES Encyclopedia. Every game released for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System by Chris Scullion, available from Pen and Sword Books or Amazon. Okay, so I think that finally actually wraps up my reviews of various Super Nintendo Entertainment System encyclopedia style books. I remember not that long ago, probably when I only had a few NES, N64, and GameCube books, lamenting that there weren't many comprehensive books for my favorite video game console of all time. And then in the last few years, boom, all these books, and a few that aren't encyclopedias too. But it will be nice to move on to other types of books, like building up to the NES comparison I mentioned, and I'll consider reviewing Chris Scullion's NES Encyclopedia then too, despite being already out for a while. He has an upcoming Genesis book in the works, as he not so subtly hinted at, which I'll consider if I have time to not be Nintendo exclusive in these book reviews. I hope my videos have been of value to you, dear viewers. If so, please hit that like button, and of course the subscribe button, which really really helps out. Indicating your support helps me to keep making these videos, and at this time, if the number of subscribers is, say, less than a thousand, it's getting hard to justify spending the time making these videos. So please consider subscribing, and also hitting that notification bell. By doing so, you'll know when the next videos are up. I definitely have a couple more book reviews already on the go, and I hope to get back to making other types of geeky videos too. Reading is great, but we do more than that on this channel, so stay tuned. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time. Soccer games again. Ooh. Should we have that or what? It's just up to you. Where <laughs> one? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Throw it. Out of that. What? Is that going to be in a blooper? Sorry.